um, John uh, Furlong, and he's here today. Oh, is this not working? Uh, Oh yeah, with his colleagues from Wales, uh, we have Elaine Sharpling, who's Director of Teacher Education at University of Wales, Trinity St. David's. Uh, Ronwyn Morris, uh, Assistant Head Teacher at Iscoli Priscelli, um, a secondary school, I think. Leanne Preville, Deputy Head Teacher of Gellyswick Primary in Pembrokeshire. And uh, Hazel Hacker, who's now Chair of the Education Workforce. Council Teacher Education Accreditation Board. So they have lots to tell us. So without further ado, I'm going to step down and hand over to John. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks so much, Trevor. Um, I just say for those who don't uh, know, know what the acronym means, Education Workforce Council, that's the equivalent to the Teachers Council in Scotland or Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland, um, where uh, Hazel is Chair of the Teacher Education Accreditation Board. Okay, there is something of a revolution taking place in Wales educationally, which you may have heard of, but just in case you haven't, there, 20 years after the evolution, there has been a, a, an acceptance that it's time Wales moved away from simply accepting uh, English education policies, and to think again, and to try to devise an educational system that instead of being focused on performativity, puts the learning needs of young people themselves at the very heart of what it's trying to do. And that has resulted in a whole range of different changes because the Welsh Government has recognised that you can't just change one bit without changing the other bits as well. So there is a new curriculum, there is also new assessment procedures, new procedures for management and leadership, for the inspectorate, that's Estin, for a new focus on research, and very important changes to teacher education, both digital teacher education and CPD. To try and get you a sense of how radical this stuff is, I'll just talk a little bit fraction about the, <coughs> the curriculum reform process that's been going on. In the future, um, the curriculum is being uh, organised into six areas of learning and experience. They're integrated. The subjects are still there, but they're more interdisciplinary in their focus. So there is um, science and technology, there is humanities, there is language learning and uh, language literacy and communication. So there's a range of different, there's these six different areas. And very importantly, and this is symbolic of what's happened, the way in which that new curriculum has been developed, it hasn't been a group of um, curriculum experts sitting in Cardiff rewriting a new curriculum. The way it's been developed is that groups of schools have come together who have a particular expertise in any one of those areas. So up to uh, about 20 schools have been, uh, uh, just over a year ago, were given a budget, they were given a bit of support, they were given access to expertise internationally, and they could commission papers, and they wrote a new framework in each of those six areas of learning experience. So the involvement of the profession in redefining the curriculum is really incredibly radical. What's also radical, though, is, is different from the past and very different from, from England, is that what has been produced is not a national curriculum to be rolled out, but a framework. And schools themselves in the future will have to adapt that framework to develop a curriculum that's appropriate for the kids in their school. And teachers are involved in a way that they haven't been involved in that sort of thing for a whole generation. There are similar sorts of changes being developed in relation to assessment as well, where there's a move away from national performance assessment to develop these strategies of school-based assessment that's much more closely attuned to the learning needs of children. So what that means is, those just giving a flavour of some of that aspiration, what that means is that, that Wales is going to expect a very different sort of teacher professionalism in the future. It's going to attempt, it's attempting to unleash the creativity of the teaching profession. And teachers in the future will have much greater control over what to teach, over how to teach, about how to assess. And you're going to need a form of professionalism that actually focuses on developing new teachers who are independent-minded, are critical practitioners, and are committed to carry on learning. It puts those things right at the very top of what we need of our new teachers. And that has major implications for initial teacher education. That's what you're trying to produce. Um, at the heart of the new approach to uh, teacher education uh, is, is, is a, a whole new accreditation process carried out under the auspices of the um, Education Workforce Council. Um, and the, there's a new set of criteria 
that, that programs have to be accredited to. And at the heart of that is a, a belief and a commitment to the idea that teacher education needs to be provided by a partnership between universities, and it's unapologetic about that, but a partnership between universities and schools. And that's based on the belief that universities and schools in principles will have access to different forms of professional educational knowledge. And somehow what teacher education programmes need to do is to bring those different forms of professional knowledge together in some way to help student teachers learn in order to develop a form of professional education that is rigorously practical, rigorously practical, but also always intellectually challenging at the same time. So that means getting universities and schools to work together in a new and different way. Now we use the term partnership, and partnership is a weasel word. It means everything. Everyone is always using a partner. <coughs> partnership It's always the best thing to slice bread. Slice bread. In, Wheel, in Wales, the, the accreditation criteria make it absolutely clear that if you're going to be accredited, then it isn't the university that is accredited. It's the university and the group of schools working around it. Every half a dozen, every dozen schools and become centrally involved in that program. And it's that partnership that's accredited. They have had to, to pass accreditation. They have had to show evidence of planning their program together, both in terms of its philosophy and the detail of what happened in any one session. And it's not just a once-off commitment. That's a, a yearly commitment to redesign the program together. There has to be opportunities for joint teaching, for university and school staff to work alongside each other particularly in school on occasions, and also in universities at time. There has to be evidence of joint governance, where schools themselves are centrally and, and, and seriously involved in the management and leadership of the educational programs they're offering. And there has to be joint accountability. That is meant changing the way in which Estino and Spectrum works in terms of what they're looking for. So all of those different things have major implications for schools have major implications for universities. The schools in Wales have been asked to recognise that initial teacher education is part of their core activity rather than an add-on when you make your classroom available for teaching practice. They've also been asked to accept, and they've accepted readily, that teaching is an intellectual activity, and that teacher education is an intellectual activity for which they're going to be contributing a significant part. That's meant a cultural change for schools. What's interesting is how keen they've been to take that move. But it's also had big implications for universities, because if schools are so centrally involved now, then it poses in hard, hard ter sh and sharp terms the question of, well, what is it that's distinctive that universities can contribute? They've got to think very hard about what it is they're making a difference. And there are two things that it seems that we've written into our criteria that make a difference. And the first is an emphasis on knowledge that comes from research, from theory, and from knowledge of good practice across Wales and internationally. Bringing that knowledge in into the system is vitally important what universities need to be responsible for doing. They also have a responsibility for supporting a particular approach to professional learning, which is based on the ideas of criticality, which uh, Trevor was talking about uh, 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 earlier this, early this afternoon. There's those two things that they are distinctive for universities. And they, at the university, have actually got to think about and make a decision about how much of what they've done in the past actually met that criteria, because that is what they're bringing to the table. And that is actually a really, really steep learning curve compared with where Wales was in much of its teacher education in the past. So, what we've done in the last two years is the Accreditation Board has um, evaluated applications from... Uh, six universities um, to become accredited with their partner schools um, and uh, in the first round uh, four of those were successful, two of them were not successful and they were provisionally accredited and they were, those four they, 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 they passed their provisional bit as well and they admitted their first students onto the new programmes this autumn the other two uh, reapplied the year later um, and redesigned their courses quite fundamentally to make sure that they were fitting this new vision um, and they were successful as well, and they'll be admitting their students under this new regime in a year's time. So now we have the opportunity to hear from colleagues one of those partnerships, 
um, University of Western City Marvin and its associated schools about how this is actually working out in practice. Okay, so it's fair to say that there is nothing like an accreditation process to be a kick, a push, a shove, a catalyst of change. And being from the oldest university in Wales to offer teacher education, and with a bicentenary on the horizon that the Vice-Chancellor was already planning the party for, to not be accredited for teacher education would have rendered the champagne somewhat uh, useless. We welcomed the accreditation process and we felt liberated by it. We were suitably challenged in building our foundations for change. We had tinkered at the edges as a university. We'd had a traditional partnership with our schools, our mentors, but it was university-led. The programmes were university-authored, they were university-owned, they were university-assessed, they were university-governed. The accreditation process then led us to think about how we would co-construct another word, weasel word, I think now, and new programmes in true collaboration with schools. And our tinkering at the edges did hold us in good stead because we had got good relationships with schools. So we put a call out to invite schools to become lead schools. So they would be our drivers of the new programmes, our sites of practice, um, our vision, and we would work with them to write the new programmes. That joint planning and joint delivery that we'd played around with a little bit now had to translate into joint ownership and joint governance. And for some people in the university, this was difficult. It had to be done, though, because we had the champagne waiting for the bicentenary. Okay, so we, we had to go there. And we, and we had already recognised that there was a, a growing gulf between the university and the school, the theory and the practice. Student teachers were viewing the theory as sitting with the university, the practice sitting with the school. Our approach to developing practical wisdom was weak. Um, student teachers would say, oh, no, I'm in school now. I'm doing it properly now. Uh, we don't need to think about the university. Oh, not another assignment. You know, how does that relate to what I'm doing in the classroom? We had recognised this. But the accreditation process was our chance to really address this problem. So we came together and we knew um, we were creating teachers for a curriculum that's not yet been written. Um, and we began by um, identifying the end product, the kind of teacher that was going to be ready to go in and teach in this landscape of reform in Wales. Um, and we looked at the programmes. Uh, we looked at how those programmes, sorry, would support the shaping of this new kind of teacher. We had a real collective desire as schools and the university together to have an impact on every aspect of our system not just the student teachers, but school leaders, teachers, and most importantly, our pupils. We wanted professional learning integrated with initial teacher education and not to be seen as separate. So we started with a blank slate. Despite having the criteria as our architecture, we really needed courage um, to go into the co-construction of the programmes with a blank slate and no hidden agendas not having already decided where things would happen. Should, we really considered, should it happen at the school or should it happen at the university? Who should be doing what? Who should be planning the content, the teaching? Even what the indicative content of those modules should be and even when the courses would happen. In fact, we, um, that resulted for us in moving uh, one of the programmes forward in the academic year. Uh, we got together as writing teams, the university and the schools 
and started to build those new programs from scratch. And an early lesson for us was to keep coming back to the criteria and to really think and, and hold tight to that vision of the teacher that we needed at the end of our program. And we had to remember, what do we really, really want for those teachers of the future? And this resulted in some lively debate, uh, tough decision making, um, as often we had some really great and valuable ideas that were discarded. Not everything could be part of our ITE programs. We'd had programs that had been added to and added to, like supermarket sweep, everything that was important, teaching of swimming, pediatric first aid, it all needed to go in because we needed to teach it all for the teachers to be ready to go into schools. It couldn't all be there. We had to decide together what really mattered. Perhaps one of the biggest problems we had was negotiating ownership of the programs. And I think it's fair to say that the partnership is the program. Um, it's not as though the partnership operates separate from the ITE program. It's where the ITE program breathes, breathes and lives. So we had to have governance structures in place for the partnership where decision making could happen. It couldn't just happen in the university and then be transferred to the school. It ha had to happen in a collective environment. So we had to set up governing bodies, if you like, strategic boards, executive boards, where the decision making would happen. The language change was very interesting to observe over the period of the co-construction. We moved from phrases like, when is the university going to send this? When is the university going to organise mentor training? When is the university going to get its act together, basically? Um, two, when are we? Now, for me, that was, it, it was emotional. It was exciting to hear strategic and executive boards, university and school partners saying, when are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? The hardest part, I think, has been going live in September. We're only seven weeks in. We piloted many aspects of the new ways of working for two years. We were, we were like fly B for pilots. We piloted everything. Um, we tried this. We tried that. We had the governance in shadow form. But... There is no way you can anticipate everything in a suite of programs of undergraduate and postgraduate. And we have come across things in the last seven weeks that looked great on paper. As con concepts, they were fab. But in practice, they have really not worked so well. And those governance structures have allowed us to come back to the table to come back to the co-construction and to be able to say, right, how do we sort this bit out? So a lesson learned would be to set up decision-making processes um, before you go into this level of partnership. Ron Wynne. Thank you. We certainly needed to transform practice, and um, this is an opportunity for us this afternoon to be able to introduce you to a new approach that we call the meet, test, share approach. And this is a key pedagogy for transforming practice, and it takes place at carefully chosen points in the timetable where there are ideal opportunities for us to link theory and practice. Now, as Elaine mentioned, this model has been piloted and piloted and evaluated and piloted again with some rigour and has been co-constructed with colleagues from us as lead schools. Now, this approach is one way now of linking theory and practice. It involves the student teacher, the practising teacher and also the university tutor in three phases of practice each one followed by a period of reflection and revision. First of all, we have the meet. Now, this is the point where student teachers are introduced to what is already written about education. 
This is where they encounter ideas about teaching and learning through existing research and practice. This is followed by the test phase. Now, the test phase allows student teachers to try something out, to rehearse, to experiment with ideas that deepen practice, but that also ensure pupil progress. This is all about building resilience. It's a safe time for student teachers to have a go, to take risks, to experiment, and to innovate. Now, through this test phase, different types of knowledge, experiential and intellectual, finally come together in the classroom. We then move on to the share phase. Now, this is where student teachers come together in networks in the lead schools. This is where they can present their reflections and their findings to the professional community. They're encouraged by peers and teacher educators alike to critique their thoughts and ideas in a social setting. Now, this is a, what we call a safe zone to transform practice, where there are no judgments. Obviously, as time goes on, the meet phase will be driven by the reflections of the share phase, being responsive to these hot topics that have been identified, creating a cycle of self-improvement and continual learning. Our model of meet, test, share involves all student teachers. Be they primary and secondary, they all come together. They get to experience different year groups and different stages, be they year one or even year eight. Different schools, be they rural or urban, Welsh medium and English medium schools, allowing them to share experiences, exploring, exploring common principles of inquiry. Leanne. By encouraging uh, the student teachers to become inquiring contributors, we have significant examples of where student teachers have had an impact on a whole school level. Change has been affected through the student teacher's eyes. And one example, uh, students came together uh, in schools with lines of inquiry related to additional learning needs. Uh, they'd met the knowledge at the university, and they'd done their own reading, and they, they came to meet in the classroom through lesson observations, observing interventions that took place, speaking to pupils and to teachers, gathering first-hand knowledge and experience that links theory and practice. And then they came together to share. And they shared at the school with the head teacher and the school's senior leadership team. And they talked about, as Ronwyn said, um, their reflections and what they'd learned. And when the head teacher asked them about their experiences and how this would inform their future practice within the classroom, they all noted one specialist speech and language intervention that they had observed, stating they'd use that within their daily class teaching. As a school, we'd not considered sharing this intervention with all our teaching staff. It was something that went on, um, delivered by a small group of staff, a specific intervention for a small group of children. But as a result of the value that the student teachers had given to that, saying that they wanted to use it in their daily pedagogy, we, we thought about that. And we had that training delivered of that intervention to our whole school teaching staff, which meant that they were able to change their practice to be able to support all our learners within the classes. And this cycle of improvement is shown to then impact the school as well as the student teachers. We're learning now that we're all learning. It has started to have an impact on every stakeholder. All staff in our schools know that they are teacher educators and have committed to supporting the next generation of teachers. There is no trade-off for our teachers, their class versus having a student teacher. All know that we are all improved by taking part in this meet, test, share model. We have an influence now on professional learning that we have never had before, a capacity to have a sphere of, a sphere of influence beyond the mental. And it's significant, new, and brilliant. In practice, for example, we have a senior member of school staff who leads one of our networks sending the draft planning for the meet, test, uh, the meet and share days to the university tutor for consideration. 
Our plans are jointly authored, delivered, and owned. However, the more that we encounter this world of collaboration, the more unknowns uh, that are revealed to us about partnership working, the things that we could never have planned for. We're learning that we need to retain a sense of discovery. People's questions open doors for thoughts, reflection, and professional learning that drives the reform journey. Elaine. One of our aims of our partnership work in our collaborative working is for the student teachers to see us as a body of teacher educators, even though we bring different things to that table. But we have agreed that our table is firmly laid and set and beautifully embellished to be the site of pr practical wisdom. We have to bring that discussion to the table together. And this means thinking about identity. Who are we? What are we doing? What are we bringing here? And I think from my perspective, as the university voice, we had to think very carefully about the role of the university teacher educator. We had become involved with things that really weren't university kinds of work. We had become bogged down with administration. We had muddying of the waters of what our role was. So it was a timely um, opportunity for the USEP working party on the intellectual knowledge base for teacher educators to come along and something that we have embraced in our partnership to think about what do we bring to the table that is equal to but different from the schools. Our student teacher identity is part of our shaping of that student teacher at the end of our programmes. We want them to be agents of change. We want them to be inquiring practitioners who are used to that social reflection in professional communities. We want them to be able to reimagine, reinvent practice that they see and we want them to challenge the status quo in Wales to close the gap. And in shaping student teachers' identities, we have distilled the work of Orchard and Winch into four research dispositions. So we have mapped these dispositions across the programmes and we want our students' teachers to be ethical, be sceptical, be part of an inquiring profession, and to be a skilled researcher. Now, we are certainly not the finished product. <laughs> we still need to continue with the same energy, our sense of progression and dynamism. Now, obviously, with the pressure of deadlines, it could have been so tempting for the university just to have taken the lead role in authoring the programmes, and for us as schools, just to have been taken the role of simply a verification process. Now, joint planning and governance has slowed the pace of change, but this leads to better outcomes and far more meaningful developments. We've had to recognise that structures needed to be in place. We needed to identify areas for development in the networks of schools that feed into the governance structures so that decisions are made to influence the programmes. Now, ideas and suggestions are still coming forward that we could never have planned for from just a one-off co-construction. For example, just last month, our network leads decided to join together to form communities of practice as a means to gather and evaluate aspects of the programme which can feed into recommendations for short, medium and longer-term developments. Schools and the university are stepping up as teacher educators with a new sense of professionalism. We are taking ownership of teaching, ensuring that newly qualified teachers will have a long-term impact on the future of education in Wales. Hey, sir. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
follow that, isn't it? Oh, unbelievable. Um, okay. <clears throat> I should. I, I've got to apologise first of all, uh, in a sense, because because this isn't my baby at all. Um, I'm a, I'm a late comer to this party, a kind of Jenny come lately, because it's only it's only two years ago, just over two years ago, that I joined the accreditation board as a member, whereas my colleagues here have been working away in Wales for for many years, you know, creating, you know, sort of on this reform journey. But it does mean that that I, although I was experienced in terms of teacher education reform in a number of countries, it does mean that I can look at things with a, a fresh pair of eyes. And so before sort of moving on too much, I just want to s sort of pick out a few things that struck me and continue to strike me as being remarkable, noteworthy in, in what is going on in Wales. Okay. Right. First of all, it's incredibly made in Wales. Here we've got a school curriculum and an ITE curriculum that talk to each other all the time. This isn't just a line in one with they talk to each other. They, it makes sense. New teachers are being created, are being developed for this new curriculum and they are help and they're working with teachers who are developing the new curriculum. So it, so it, it's amazing. And it's made in Wales. It's distinctive. Okay. Collaboration and coherence. It's wonderful. You've got the Department for Education and Skills, you've got Qualification Wales, you've got the Education Workforce Council, you've got the University of the Law. Everybody's working together. Unheard of. But yet there might be little baby turf wars and little pockets. Of course there will be, and within the university, the school, whatever. Basically, people are working together for their country. They want to improve the quality of education for every child in their country. That's what they're doing. And there is this coherence, an intellectual coherence about what they're trying to do. Not a question of a number of different reforms by different people who suddenly had a brainwave or a new ideology. To act in. A lot of thinking has gone into this. And that thinking, for example, in terms of ITE, which I'll talk about in as well, has come from a very deep understanding of research and scholarship in learning and teaching and teacher education, professional learning. Ambitious learners, ambitious teachers. I think you can tell from when Collie's speaking, this is all about ambition. This isn't saying, ooh, this is about, come on. This is ambition for every child, for every new teacher, and for all those working with them. Teachers, they're not operatives. They're not brilliant because they can put into practice what somebody else has decided for them. This is teachers, and it's very demanding, creative, agile, intellectual workers. They're going to have to develop the curriculum. They're going to have to think. It's going to be quite tough. But it's what teaching is. It's what real teaching is to bring about learning. You have to be an intellectual who's creative. Otherwise, all you're doing is having children in front of you who get older. <laughs> the importance of research and scholarship. As I said, the, John, who led all the work of the development of the ITE curriculum as advisor to the government, all those years of his own research and scholarship, but drawing on other research and scholarship, has fed into the development of, this, of the ITE accreditation. And colleagues here are talking about research and scholarship within the universities and within schools and the new teachers being encouraged to engage in research and scholarship. It's important. What we've got is expertise is not a dirty word. Expert is not a dirty word. Theory is not something you have to mutter under your breath or anything like that. It's great. You can be an intellectual, you can engage in research and scholarship. As approaches to teacher uh, education, you've got encouragement of an investment in research 
and innovation, as you can see from Colin's talking here, it's all going to change. It's all going to develop. And one of the things we have to do, I say we, I mean the accreditation board, is to be responsive to those changes and developments. I think I've gone off script a bit, but never mind. That doesn't matter, does it? Okay. So, oh, it doesn't work. What's not to learn about what's going on there? All those things. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Okay. That's all very well. But how do we maintain momentum? Of course, there are dangers. There's a danger of innovation fatigue. We all know that. Excuse me, I'm only 24, but look at me. You know, it's innovation fatigue. <laughs> so there is that danger. <clears throat> and we all know there will be naysayers muttering. Oh, we've seen this all before. What goes around comes around. It won't work. And we all know that tucked away, lurking in dark corners, in lots of staff rooms, in universities and in schools, there'll be people saying, oh, once I pay my mortgage, I'm off. You know, the members of the exit com committee will be there. We know that. Nobody's being sort of utterly romantic about, about this. People will have to be encouraged, supported, as, you know, as we move along. But within the partnerships, the overwhelming positive voice and, and you've seen that this afternoon, this evening, is one of excitement, emotion, yeah, very emotional, and energy. And that's the overwhelming, that's the predominant voice. Okay. So what are we, is it we've got to do with the, in the EWC now, of, as we go forward in the education workforce national? Well, one of the things, of course, is the diversity of the education workforce to enable, or to, yes, to, to move towards the, the teacher population being much more representative of the nation's population. And there, there are two things that are, that are happening about that. One is the introduction of alternative routes um, into teaching, um, which are not in place yet, but the Open University of Wales uh, won the contract for a national programme um, or had two routes. One is a salaried route, not employment-based route, a salaried route, and the other one is a part-time route. And the Open University of Wales has won that contract, and it will be undergoing the accreditation process uh, between now and Christmas. Okay. Um, so that's one thing to try to try and bring more people into the profession different people into the profession. And the other thing, of course, is, is recruitment, as everybody in England knows as well. Actually working hard at recruitment and trying to make teaching more attractive, more exciting um, than is often perceived. Okay, it's more sexy, really, isn't it? It's, it's, that, that's what it is, so it's lost. The other thing is, um, about inspection and monitoring for compliance. The, the board, the accreditation board, has a, a responsibility in answering to the Education Workforce Council for the monitoring for compliance within the partnerships in terms of the accreditation criteria. But obviously, if you've got inspection and you've got monitoring for compliance, there can be overload. So very typical of what is happening in Wales, first of all, you have Esther, the inspectorate, working with a stakeholders forum about, with the new curriculum, what might inspection look like, and it is going to be very different from what went on in the past. But secondly, we, the EWC and Esther, are talking together about how both those things can be done, inspection and monitoring, without it being excessively bureaucratic.
bureaucratic. In other words, not overburdening the partnership, not overburdening schools and higher education. And we're working on that. We're talking to each other at the moment in a, I should say, in a, in a very <coughs> non-competitive way. You know, that's more monitoring, that's your inspection, it's not, not at all. And what, we don't know what, what that will look like eventually, because we're talking about it, but we do know that our, one of the principles is, first of all, it must be in line with the accreditation criteria and the whole new culture of the particular, and secondly, it must not be excessively bureaucratic or burdensome for the partnerships who are working so hard anyway to get their programmes working. Okay, so that, that's what we're working on at the moment. The other thing is about building on professional relationships. Um, you mentioned, no, you mentioned Elaine, you mentioned the accreditation process, which was utterly invigorating um, for us, and actually I think it was, it was, it was for you too, because it was based on professional dialogue. The whole thing was about professional dialogue. Nobody was inspecting it. We wanted to talk. We wanted to explore. We wanted to look at what does <coughs> the notion of clinical practice mean when you start trying to put it into practice? What does it mean for schools and universities to be jointly accountable and so on? And there was a lot of, a lot of time on everybody's part, a lot of talking, a lot of listening, and so on. Now, a lot of good, very good relationships were built, and we want, in the EWC, to actually build on those relationships. We want to continue those relationships. So one of the things, excuse me, one of the things we want to do is to <coughs> continue to listen, to continue to be responsive. I mean, Elaine, for example, mentioned, I think it was Elaine, mentioned that there were one or three of you hinted at it. There were things that have cropped up which actually are not quite working out as you would imagine they, they might. Now, one of the things when we're engaging in monitoring so on, we're interested in is what are those things you're finding especially challenging? What are those things that have taken you by surprise? What are the things you know now that had you known earlier you might have joined be fine for, and so on and so forth. So it's about listening and about taking things back from what's happening and then being able to support and, and, and yeah, in any way that we can. And the last thing is about supporting... Oh, <laughs> oh you want me to fiddle with this? Speed up. Oh, speed up, okay, sorry. Okay, okay, sorry. And the last thing is, sorry, the last thing is supporting collaboration. And again, it's about, if you like, the, the internet may be a driver of change in Wales, but competition is not. It is not a driver for desirable change in Wales, competition. So the EWC, along with lots of other um, agencies, are fostering collaboration across the partnerships, because this is about the way. Okay, last word, John. The last word is this. I mean, as I say, I, I, feel in, I feel immensely privileged to have been involved in this and to continue being involved. And all I know that if I were younger, there's only one way I would be going across the Prince of Wales Bridge. Okay? <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>